Investing.com podcast. Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of InvestorIdeas.com podcast, looking at cannabis news, stocks to watch, as well as insights from thought leaders and experts. In today's podcast, I'm interviewing Matt Markevich, who is the Managing Director of Innovation Shares, which also manages the Cannabis ETF, trading on the New York Stock Exchange as THCX, where we'll be talking about the cannabis industry in general, as well as the recent news regarding the Cannabis ETF. So today I'm here with Matt Markovich, the Managing Director of Innovation Shares, which is also part of the Cannabis ETF, which trades on the New York Stock Exchange as THCX. So Matt, it's great to be able to talk to you. Could you tell me a little bit about your background, as well as Innovation Shares and the Cannabis ETF, and how you ended up there? Thanks for having me on, first of all, Taylor. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm a 22-year veteran of Wall Street. Uh, have had various roles uh, in research, trading, client relationship, uh, and I cut my teeth on ETFs over 10 years ago at uh, an asset manager called BlackRock. Uh, they own a, a small the ETF division called iShares, uh, which uh, a lot of listeners will probably know and um, launched over 150 funds as part of the capital markets team there and really wanted to do something a little more entrepreneurial in the ETF space and started uh, this company, Innovation Shares, with a few partners in uh, the uh, late summer of 2017. We launched uh, two ETFs uh, earlier in 2018. One's a thematic blockchain ETF and the other is a autonomous and electric vehicle ETF, both on the New York Stock Exchange. So we, as a provider of unique thematic ETFs, we were looking for another idea. We had been getting a lot of demand from clients that we were talking to about our other products, uh, about potentially launching a cannabis ETF, and there were some challenges associated with that, but uh, we were able to get it out the door uh, on, on July 9th of this year. So for any for our listeners who are wondering, because there are so many different ETFs out there, what really separates innovation shares ETFs and especially your cannabis ETF from the many that are out there in the market today? The unique thing about innovation shares is how we build the index that the fund tracks, whereby part of our methodology is using a patent pending process that applies a natural language processing algorithm um, that's rooted in artificial intelligence that looks at media sentiment for stocks related to a particular theme. And what we're trying to do is include stocks in a long-only portfolio that have positive sentiment. So think about what a lot of your listeners do is they hear maybe some ideas on your podcast and then they go and they Google stock X, Y, Z, and they read various articles. Well, they're forming opinions doing that research by reading those various news articles. And they, if they're along the stock already or they own it, they may want to sell it because they're reading a bunch of negative articles. Or if they don't own it and they read everyone, all these reporters talking about how great this stock is, they may be more apt to go and buy it. So investor sentiment or behavior rather is often uh, – affected and impacted by what the media is saying about these stocks. So we apply this process, what's called a sentiment overlay, into the construction of our portfolios. And that's really what differentiates us you know, outside of other ETF providers in the marketplace today. So when you're looking at the cannabis industry then, are you looking primarily at that sentiment factor when you're deciding on which companies you're including, or is there other factors that you're including as well? Yeah, there are other factors. Uh, we do have some uh, rules in building the portfolio, uh, and they are intended to make sure that the portfolio is built with liquidity and diversity in mind. One of those rules is that a stock must have a minimum $100 million market cap, U.S., in order for, for to even be you know considered to be in the portfolio. The second is it, it has to be – the stock has to – on one of five exchanges around the world, which are the Australian Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, the Toronto Stock Exchange, and the TSX Venture. So if a stock is traded somewhere else, we cannot own it in the fund. 
we also have some liquidity requirements as well, and um, we rebalance this portfolio monthly. And each stock that is in the portfolio at the rebalance time cannot represent more than 8% of the portfolio. And we apply what's called a modified market cap approach, meaning that the larger stocks will have a large weighting. So the canopies and Tilrays and Kronoses of the world will generally have a higher weighting than, say, a Fire and Flower or a Valens Grow Works, for instance. So as well, when you're looking at this cannabis industry, then you mentioned that there's some diversity uh, as well to include in that ETF. What sectors of the cannabis industry are you looking at and maybe where are you noticing the biggest growth areas right now? So we like to think about uh, this cannabis portfolio as, again, not only diversified uh, from uh, you know the number of stocks in the portfolio, of which there are 36 right now, but from the diversity of sub-themes in the cannabis industry. So you have, obviously, the Canadian licensed producers or the LPs. Uh, there are 18 of the stocks in the portfolio are, are LPs at the moment, but then there are stocks that are associated with ancillary services or products, such as Scott's miracle Grow or Perk and Elmer, which provides testing. We have a few, couple international stocks in the portfolio that focus solely on international markets outside of the U.S. and Canada in legal markets. And there are other stocks such as uh, Extractors, yeah. like Radiant Technologies or Neptune, and that is a very – Metafarm Labs up in Canada. Those are uh, you know, some of the themes that we're seeing a lot of rapid growth in right now. As well because you're also focusing on the sentiment factor, how much is the CBD market starting to come into play as far as stocks being selected or as far as companies uh, that are coming to your attention? Great question. So we do have two pure play CBD companies in the portfolio, one being Charlotte's Web, which is currently the largest holding the fund, and a company uh, out of North Carolina, CBDMD, that was recently added at, at our last rebalance. And we have seen an increase in uh, more positive sentiment regarding these stocks. And sort of you, you alluded to earlier, the cannabis industry is, is, is one where sentiment is rapidly fluctuating from positive to negative, story by story. And we feel that our tool of you know, using this sentiment overlay to help build the portfolio will benefit investors over the longer term. I guess the ETF has had a bit of movement as far as companies coming on and off in the last month. Uh, you recently added Valance, I believe, and then also, obviously, there's big issues with CanTrust. Could you talk about maybe the last couple of months of uh, growth and change for your ETF and maybe where things are going to be heading in the next couple of months? What news do you guys have coming up? So, as you alluded to, we did have uh, you know a fairly active reshuffling of the portfolio this past a rebalance and uh, you know adding Valens, CBDMD as I mentioned, Fire and Flower, as well as a company called N-Wave, which has a proprietary drying technology. It's being used in food dehydration for a while, and the company has somewhat recently applied this technology to cannabis. Quite quite an interesting story. Uh, we also removed uh, a cannabis REIT down in uh, that's traded down on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, innovative industrial properties, as well as can trust, as you alluded to. So it was a very active, uh, very active rebalance period uh, for us. That's not always going to be the case. Again, the, there were a lot of uh, news items and corporate actions going on, some good, some bad, over the summer here for for cannabis companies, um, and that's why there was a lot of activity. And you know, I can't say what's going to, what the what the portfolio is going to hold going forward. Uh, but you can you know, imagine that there is going to be, you know, some changes based on you know, corporate developments in, in the space. But um, again, that's a monthly rebalance, so you know, investors can always look, you know, at our at our website thcxetf.com for news uh, and uh, sign up for to receive press releases from from, from our, uh, you know, on a regular basis. Because you're involved in all of these. Uh 
well, obviously innovative spaces right now. I mean, you have blockchain, you have electric vehicles and, and the cannabis. Um, how, I guess, volatile and how much fluctuation are you seeing in your cannabis stocks versus those other two industries? Because they're also fairly new and have a lot of, uh, they have just as much change of influence over what people think of them in the media often. So how much of a difference is there between each of those three? Well, the other industries, uh, blockchain and, and uh, electric and autonomous vehicles, the companies are a little more established. Remember that cannabis uh, as an industry, al although the plant's been around and used for thousands of years, it's been an office. It's been an industry that's largely been operating in the shadows for you know, the past century or so, especially in the in North America, uh, and it's only been in the past couple of years that the legal cannabis industry is able to access the capital markets. So you have a lot of IPOs, you have a lot of RTOs, and the capital markets activity has been heating up. Many of the companies in the portfolios for the other two uh, funds, uh, they've been around for a while, You know, maybe with the exception of, say, a Tesla or an, a Chinese electric car company called NEO that launched, uh, that, that listed last year. So they're a little more established companies with established revenue streams, business models that investors are already comfortable with. Investors in the cannabis industry are still getting more comfortable with the quarterly news flow, how the uh, companies, uh, the cannabis companies are reporting financials. But that's why it's nice to see companies in the portfolio like a Scott's Miracle Grow, which has been around for a while. It's just, I don't want to say it's a household brand, of course, but Scott's has exposure to the cannabis industry through its Hawthorne gardening unit, but it's been around as a company and an NYSE listed stock for a long time. So to have some familiar names in the portfolio helps investors understand and get comfortable with the, the trajectory of the legal cannabis industry in both the U.S. and Canada. How much did you find, not to sort of belabor on it too much, but how much did you find that the news with CanTrust did affect the investor confidence in the market as far as what uh, you're, was, you're concerned with with your ETF? Yeah, it was a, it, we noticed a massive change in, in, in media sentiment again. Um, and, you know, it was the driving reason for removing it from the portfolio. Uh, and obviously it's, turned out to be a good move at this stock. I think as of yesterday or two days ago was uh, trading below its IPO price. Yeah. And uh, even having a rough go of things. <laughs> yeah. So it ended up being a, uh, you know, a, a smart deletion and um, it's, it's something that it's, I, I can't, you know, again, as a, someone who's been analyzing securities for, for two decades, it's going to be sort of tough for them to dig out of this hole uh, that they're in right now. How much is are you expecting the Safe Banking Act uh, to influence sort of that stability factor for the cannabis industry in the U.S. at least? Well, if it goes through, of course, uh, I think it would be just a watershed moment for the industry, uh, particularly for us. Uh, the question arises, will the passage of the potential passage of the Safe Banking Act, will that enable uh, companies to uh, easier access the U.S. capital markets, or in other words, list on the NYSE or NASDAQ. And um, for us, as I mentioned er earlier in the in the show, we right now have a requirement that a stock has to be listed on one of those five exchanges. So we're not allowed to own stocks on the CSE or stocks that trade OTC. Because of that, the more listings that we'll see on the NASDAQ or, or we would see on the NASDAQ or NYSE, that would be uh, it enable us to 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 broaden out the, the the choices, the breadth of the fund, and potentially further increase uh, the diversity and number of names that uh, we own. So again, from a fund specific standpoint, I think it would be uh, you know massive. It, it also, from a broader investing standpoint, um, you know we believe it would open the market up to a lot more institutional involvement in uh, the, the cannabis equity space. So right now, you're not seeing many of the largest fund managers in the world uh, getting involved in cannabis because it does remain a federally illegal substance. So if the Safe Banking Act will allow 
those institutions and those asset managers to become more comfortable with owning the stock of these publicly traded companies, then again, this could be a, a watershed moment for, for the industry. Yeah, that's what a lot of people have been speculating. As far as other things that might affect what's going to come up in the industry, what are you paying attention to uh, other than, you know, just a safe banking act or something like that, that, that could really influence, uh, again, some of the companies you have in your ETF or some of the companies you might be adding in the coming months? So while the North America growth story is interesting, because that's where a lot of our investors are based, I think the, the growth of the um, global cannabis story is quite interesting. Uh, you know, we're seeing some movement in some countries uh, around the world, whether it be Mexico, Portugal, New Zealand, uh, on the regulatory front. And there are companies that will be either, uh, that are traded now or will be, you know, listing in the future that have access to these markets. Uh, you've seen a lot of Canadian LPs, of course, you know, use the money that they've raised over the past couple of years to expand abroad. And I think it's a, it's, it's a right move. A lot of the companies in the U.S., the, the MSOs in the U.S. don't necessarily have the wallet to do that right now. So that capital advantage for the LPs is is uh, extremely you know important in terms of growing the business model going forward in the years ahead. So as these regulatory changes occur in the markets uh, around the world, you know, it, it, they definitely bear watching because it's going to be um, you know, an opportunity for revenue expansion and hopefully multiple expansion for a lot of the companies that are entrenching themselves in these markets. As of yet, uh, regarding your ETF, are there any companies on there with an international uh, scale in mind or companies that are out based outside of sort of the North American scale right now? Sure. Uh, there are two in particular. Uh, one is Chiron Life Sciences. Uh, which has uh, really their presence is in Latin America, yeah. uh, as well as Pharmaciello. And uh, these two, again, are uh, Pharmaciello, again, Latin American focus. And uh, the, not only from a customer base, but you know, the, the, uh, the crop is being grown in countries outside of the United States or Canada. And uh, that's a real, relatively... The, you know, new market, and uh, but you know the importation of cannabis to, or or distillates to the U.S. and and Canada is you know going to be an evolving growth story over the next few years. Yeah, those are the two companies I've seen that that obviously stand out. I think they're the only two I can think of that are based out of Latin America right now that are uh, actually have you know important news coming out and are actually staying relevant and and actually have some funds behind them out there. Is yeah. that is that pretty much what what I see is what what's there as far as there's not a lot of small uh, smaller outlets showing up in Latin America right now. The only other company that's not a part of the portfolio, but it's on our radar, of course, is Avicana, which recently uh, began trading uh, up in Canada, and uh, they have a uh, you know their the center of their operations are. are are in Colombia, and they're working on you know, their plans to to export to both Canada and Europe, but more on the uh, pharmaceutical grade side of the equation. And uh, again, the, the stock's a little too small uh, for our portfolio right now. Again, not being a uh, hundred million U.S. market cap last time I checked, but it's on our watch list for sure. And uh, that's one again, a new story. But definitely something to definitely stock to to keep an eye on. Uh, one other thing I'd like to ask about, I'm sure you have at least some companies that are involved in it as well. But how much do you think the edibles and beverages element uh, coming in Canada, as well as eventually uh, probably in a lot of parts of the world, if it does go through, um, how much do you see that impacting certain companies and maybe even some of the companies that you're paying attention to? Yeah, so cannabis 2.0 up in Canada is yeah. it's commonly referred to, uh, which is expected to go, uh, you know, online in in December in terms of seeing sales. It, it's another exciting aspect to the Canadian cannabis story. But as you alluded to, this cannabis is a it's a global growth theme, and that's part of why this 
a generational investment opportunity is so exciting. It's just not uh, an industry that's you know, stuck in the U.S. or Canada. So as more regulatory bodies around the world get comfortable with not only you know, medical or recreational cannabis, but using cannabis as an additive to food and beverages, and I, you know, it, at some point it's going to get there. You're going to see large multinational corporations get involved. They're just not if you know they're they're popular in the U.S. It's going to be something that's going to be exported to you know around the world. I'm not saying you know, Coca-Cola is going to be putting CBD in drinks in you know Central Africa, for instance, but uh, you know. Europe especially, potentially Asia, but have to comply with all of the, the regulatory framework you know, throughout the world. But it's maybe a little bit of a slower process for now, but it'll get there. And uh, you know, there are some companies in the portfolio that are right now focused on the North American market, such as New Age Beverages, which is in the portfolio, and companies like Hexo, H-E-X-O, yeah. uh, and Hexo is, you know, employing this strategy of wanting to become, you know, the top partner to, uh, I think they call it the hub and spoke model to various consumer product companies around the world, whether it be beverages, makeups, nutraceuticals. They want to be the company that, you know, is behind the additive to all the products, which uh, is a very interesting tactic. Yeah, I've, uh, I've actually read a lot about Hexo as well. They're an interesting company in the area. Uh, as your, you know, the cannabis ETF right now, are there a lot of other ETFs you're finding entering into the cannabis space? And do you see that happening over the next coming months as this industry does get more mature, as regulations do become uh, a little bit more lenient or more accepting of the industry? Would you see that there's going to be lots of competition in that area as well and lots of people trying to create uh, more of these um, sort of stable ETFs for people to invest in? Right now, there are five U.S. listed cannabis focused ETFs. We are one of two what's called passively managed cannabis ETFs, meaning uh, we track a, a, an index. The other three actively managed, meaning that there's no index for the portfolio managed to track. You, you're sort of just picking stocks on yeah. whatever metrics, you know, it's not a rules based portfolio like we have, systematic rebalancing, et cetera. Um however, uh you know, there are some differences in the ETFs. Um so for instance, we feel it's not pertinent to hold tobacco or alcohol stocks in our portfolio because those are slow growing and you know, industries and defensive industries and cannabis is a growth industry, no pun intended. Yeah. Uh and you, why would you mix a growth stock with a defensive stock? It's not something that you really would do from a portfolio management standpoint. So again, we don't hold any tobacco or uh, alcohol stocks in, in the portfolio. Um, I believe there will be a couple more entrants to the marketplace, but there are, uh, let's call it what, 150 plus cannabis stocks publicly traded in North America right now. However, a lot of them just won't meet the requirements from a size and liquidity standpoint that portfolio managers you know, may need to feel like they have a big enough universe from which to choose. So, again, I think there'll be a few more ETFs that that, that launch, but again, it's part of the, the maturation process of the industry, along with the regulatory catalysts that the industry needs, such as the Safe Banking Act that you mentioned, uh, to help get companies to list their stock, you know, in public marketplaces. When we're looking at that number as well of, you know, this over 150 companies, do you see that number thinning out over time? Or is this an industry where there's going to be a lot more companies coming up over the coming years? Or is it going to actually start consolidating more and more because of the demand for scale? On a global basis, I would say you're going to see more more than 150 companies. Uh, net, net, you'll see an increase. Uh, here in North America, that number may shrink, you know, over time due to consolidation, companies fading away because they just can't survive. They don't have the economies of scale or the proper capital structure. Um, Once again, that was Matt Marquette. Overall, again, I feel globally, we'll see more cannabis companies hitting the public markets over the next couple of years. 
If you wish to find out more about the Cannabis ETF, you can click the link attached in the article or visit thcxetf.com for more information. That's all for today's podcast. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. That's all for today's podcast. Podcast is now a certified word trademark on the blockchain through Cognate Incorporated CM certification. InvestorIdeas.com podcasts are also available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play Music, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, and TuneIn. If you'd like to be a guest or sponsor of this podcast, please contact InvestorIdeas.com. Investor Ideas reminds all listeners to read our disclaimers and disclosures on the InvestorIdeas.com website. And this podcast is not an endorsement to buy products or services or securities. Investors are reminded that all investments involve risk and possible loss of investment. Investor Ideas does not condone the use of cannabis except where permissible by law. Our site does not possess, distribute, or sell cannabis products.